Listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. To episode two of the Triunity series with Dr. Shamil Asher. I'm Randy Moggins from OffPlanetRadio.com. And uh, in the first episode, what you heard was basically a breakout of the concepts that go into the book, The Soul Revolution, which is the, uh, the book that we're using for the material in this series. And so today we're going to kind of go a little bit further. We're going to begin to explain some of the definitions that are required to understand this. For those listeners out there who want the depth of this, you need to get the book, The Soul Revolution by Dr. Shamil Asher. The web links are with um, the YouTube video, the audio clips on the website, and we'll make sure that you have that information. And we welcome again our presenter, Dr. Shamil Asher. Welcome. Hey, Randy. How's it going? Good to be here. Good. Good to have you on, my friend. So we kind of broke it out in in the... uh, in the first episode, where we were going to go with this, and I know you get feedback. We sent the audio files out to your group um, before they were actually uploaded. So you get some feedback, and uh, tell us a little bit about the feedback you're getting and, and why we're going to do what we're going to do in the first part today, which is basically going to some definitions. Uh, well, the feedback is uh, how, how it has been for many times. Uh, people, I talk too fast, I go through things too quickly. And I expect everyone to know what I'm talking about. So I, uh, uh, I will endeavor to slow down a bit. And um, and I was also uh, told that we, sh- you know, it would be a good idea to define some of the terms I'm using that are in the book, because um, I might be using them a little differently than most people understand them, uh, and uh, maybe that would make everything go a little bit more smoothly as we go through this. Um, so I can, uh, you know, some of the words that, we, that uh, you might have, heard, they might have heard in the uh, first, uh, in the first tape, which was, uh, you know, like the word narratives, archons, rates, uh, soul fear, and uh, a little bit, and also they said they give a little bit more explanation on the holographic universe, uh, because I guess a lot of people really uh, have no clue of that, uh, that that that's even has been for quite a while a huge scientific topic, and now. As as we'll talk about in a little while, uh, it, emerging at, at high levels uh, of government and media. So, um, yeah, we're actually I, I, seeing this whole thing just completely burst out of the seams in the media right now. Yeah, and I did. I, I, it, amazingly, I didn't realize it was a prediction when I wrote it in the book a few months ago, or two years ago when it, when it was written or being written, but. Uh, we will get into that. That there's of why uh, I, I believe that they are um, <clears throat> hitting us with that. Uh, pre- actually, pretty hard, uh, pretty quickly. I, I, I was surprised to hear it, but we'll get into that after yep. I, yep. I guess so, so I get all these definitions. So, some of the definitions that we're dealing with, and and you talk about the narrative as being um, well. So to put it in delicately, in some ways, the narrative is really the line of BS that we've been fed pretty much from the beginning. And so let's let's talk about the narrative, what that means in the context of of your work in the book itself. Okay, um, I look at the narratives and I and I put it in the book as narratives or false narratives, and many times I'll put it in the book as control narratives and actually control narratives. 
is uh, is probably the best uh, overall uh, understanding of it. it it's uh, the narratives, the way I'm depicting it, are are units of control or tools. Actually, they're they're tools and uh, em- em- employed by these uh, entities uh, over everyone. And um, they're basically uh, written, I guess, by them and, uh, and then uh, given down to their human sycophants, which I'm sure are very few over time, uh, throughout all times. And uh, the human sycophants uh, and most of our history have been religious by nature, uh, you know, in- institute them. So they become lines of beliefs, uh, which become uh, emotionally uh, embedded in, in each person. And, uh, and thus these beliefs uh, exert uh, constant control uh, over what we believe or want to believe. So they're uh, driven emotionally and especially through the ego. Um, and, and when they become these beliefs, these narratives uh, actually control us. So they, they control the dialectic. They, they control each person and thus control larger populations. Uh, and when they probably how it works, like it works for us, same thing we do, uh, when we institute something, say in our business, say we have a business, uh, we institute marketing or something, uh, and we instit- we, we, we we try to somewhat of a shotgun effect, and and we see initially, all right, none of this is working, but this is working, and we'll call this Christianity, uh, and we'll say, all right, uh, let's let's really let's uh, let's let's keep that let's keep that one rolling, let's uh, let's let's build on it, let's add superstition, let's add more layers, uh, then we'll add more. Um, sections to it, so there's different versions of it out there, and, 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 and that's what you see. That's why you'll see a lot of the other um, ancient religions dwindling and dwindling and dwindling, while one or two use more useful ones, useful tools, seem, seem to be uh, growing and uh, added to and added to. So that's how I use the narratives. The narratives are tools. Uh, that are used to literally program people, I guess, if, if you want to, you know, break it right down. Uh, program people so that you assimilate the information, you believe it, and then your soul projects it, because ultimately we are creative beings uh, in this slowed-down universe, so, or the slowed-down creation. You know, I just and looked at the, uh, I just looked at the dictionary, and this is just the dictionary that's on my, my MacBook computer, but one of the definitions it gives for narrative is a representation of a particular situation or process in such a way as to reflect or conform to an overarching set of aims or values, which I think is actually pretty yeah. pretty accurate about what we're talking about here. It's a, you know it's it's designed to conform the the opinions, the mental processes, and the functions of a of a given group. Uh, in in a certain direction, right, and that's exactly how they're used. So, and and the the beauty about them, or I guess from their perspective, the beauty about them is that nobody notices them. They really don't. They they just they're just there, and they become, and they become more because we consent to assimilating them, believing them, and projecting them. Which means, which that's how they become more. So it's a, it's a very simple process. Uh, you know, it's it's just it's really it's actually so simple because if if you if you're the archon if you're the entity, you know how the aspects the the you know how the creator created or or know what the creation because you are the creation, so you understand the creation and you understand how to manipulate it. So no different than us. You know, we understand how certain DNA, a certain uh, level of DNA works, and we have come to the point where we know how to manipulate it. So it's the exact same thing, you know, as above, so below. We, we do and uh, mirror the exact things that they do because they have, through narratives, controlled everyone to reflect their image. See, so that's how that's working. So that's the first definition that I use. 
So you mentioned the Archons, which takes us into, um, I guess, the second one we want to break out. Because, um, you know, I've been talking about the Archons on Off Planet Radio since 2010. And that was not a new subject to me because I had gone back and studied, you know, the Gnostic works. But when I began to see the implementation of the Archons and how they relate to our present technological era, it became a lot creepier and a lot more real to me. So let's move into the Archons, energy wraiths, devils, fallen, etc. Yeah, and the only reason why I use, uh, I, I really didn't want to use the word Archons in the book, um, because in the Greek, all it means is rulers, but... I decided I had to use the word because so many people are uh, into it and under, uh, watching it and trying to understand what it's all about. And that word has been used quite a bit. The title has been used quite a bit for a while, so I decided, well, I better use what people know or think they know. And <clears throat> but and now I, I, you might agree that it's not just a word meaning ruler anymore. It's it's almost like a definition of their race, you know. Of, of who they are rather than just a word. It's kind of morphed into more. Uh, we, we've morphed into more than that, but I, that's why I, I used it. So uh, the archons I also use, I also call them energy rates, uh, very specifically because I break out in the book why uh, they have coerced us through narratives uh, to sign on, to consent to their program. Uh, because they need us, and uh, so, but other people, uh, you know, because it's, it's written everywhere, other people believe them to be, you know, devs, devils, uh, jinn, fallen, whatever, uh, this this is who I'm speaking about when I use any of these terms, and, uh, you know, but they, they are written uh, through various words or titles, uh, descriptive titles, they're written into virtually every aspect of uh, human historical and religious cultic superstition. You know, they're, uh, they're so, they, but you know what people don't understand is that they're no different than you. They're, they're just soul creations. They're living souls. They're, they just have access to however long uh, more memory, more hmm. information than, than we do at this point. Because as I say in the book, I believe my, uh, through the evidence that it is these physical bodies that firewall our souls while here so that we can't access any of that. Uh, and I go into great lengths in the book on why that is and a lot of the science behind it. And so we have... Uh, so they're, they're just other living souls that have been created by the, you know, the prime creator. Uh, uh, but evidently, we understand them through their superstition as being uh, those unrepentantly, who, uh, who unrepentantly broke... Uh, his first law of free will in some previous time and space, they did something. We don't know what it was. And uh, they have been since relegated to the lower realms because being, yeah, I guess more ancient, more uh, at some point, uh, more trustworthy, they were. They had access to higher realms for them. Not anymore. And, so is it fair to say uh, that this is kind of like that that pantheon of the gods thing? I mean, we sort of view them as yeah, gods. I, I, I think. Well, of course, anybody views them as gods, right? I mean, uh, that, that's even been proven on this planet how easy that is to do. We have uh, World War. It's a World War Two. Uh, I can't remember who they were. Some tribal group somewhere in the South Pacific, never saw anybody before, white man, however, uh, yeah. you, yeah, the U.S. Um, uh, Air Force, I believe, went there, used the island as, <clears throat> for an airstrip, and blah, Yeah, blah, this blah, was, blah, the, they were called the cargo cults, that's, that's basically what they were, they were people who associated um, the U.S. military onloading and offloading different materials and they would leave i guess some, some tokens behind for the natives there and it became as became known as the cargo cult oh really okay i haven't heard a term like that what i saw uh was the aftermath was many years later on a portion of the island 
they had created their own little landing strip uh, that seemed to end at the edge of a cliff, and at the edge of the cliff, they actually made out of bamboo, I, I, I suspect, uh, what looked like a Piper Cub airplane. Uh, <laughs> of course. And, 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 and they, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because... It, you yeah, know. And it's, and, but, but, you know, there you go. I mean, it just, it, it, it is, you know, it, it works on all levels. So, uh, yeah, I do believe that, you know, the, every 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 culture has shown that uh, they believe there's... Uh, several levels of heaven, whether there's three or 12 or nine, you know, however, it doesn't matter how many there are, but I, 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 I go through in the book quite a bit to, to show that it's quite obvious that uh, just like here, again, as above, so below, just like here, if you are working for the government or something like that, or even a corporation, you are uh, based on your level of experience, uh, trustworthiness, uh, wisdom, what have you. Uh, you are afforded a certain level of a clearance, uh, and mm-hmm. that clearance affords you a certain level of access, right? Access to, you know, the third floor rather than the sixth floor, the ninth floor, whatever have you, or subfloors. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and there you have it. And, and uh, if, if you have a high clearance and uh, you do something really stupid and they'll pull your clearance and now, you, you know, now you don't have a TSSI clearance anymore, you have uh, something else. Uh, much lower, uh, level three, and, and boom, and there you go, bang, you can't, you've lost all your access, uh, you're in the uh, outer limits, so to say, you've been relegated to the uh, to the abyss, and, and uh, so uh, we can see all these similarities, and that's, that's, I break it down very commonly and very simply like that, when I look at all these things, I don't super spiritualize any of this stuff, in fact, I go way the other direction, because everyone has super spiritualized this stuff for far too long. And uh, because it's not their fault either, you know, I mean, we have the, the narratives are being layered. They're purposely built, they're purposely layered, they're purposely augmented, and, uh, you know, there you go. And uh, it's, not, it's not everybody's fault other than the fact that, you know, they don't want to see, you know, or, or, or they're comfortable. You know, if, if, if anything, uh, it's the fault of everybody trying to remain comfortable that they haven't learned anything. But... Um, you know, in this case, uh, that's that's what I think happened to these guys, and and uh, and 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 like I say in the book, it's uh, very specific on why uh, why they've uh, been forced to. Uh, it's I, I I personally believe it's life and death for them. That that that's why they they um, have this soft enslavement going on. So uh, really. Um, you know, their main goal has always been uh, controlling us through narratives uh, in order to produce negative frequencies uh, by our consent, if you want to call them vibes, you know, consciously or sub, uh, or unconsciously or subconsciously, uh, through many false uh, negative control narratives, you know, for their own benefit. So as far as the energy rates, that's, that's how I look at them. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're doing what they're doing uh, partially out of rebellion anymore, it seems. Mostly out of need to stay alive. So basically, we are we feed them. We feed them with. Yeah, our, you know we're the energizer bunnies. You know you got all you got a, a planet seven billion energizer batteries, and, and uh, you know go forth and multiply uh, because we need your physicalities to go forth and multiply. Um, if you don't, then uh, you know it doesn't work for us. And, and you know what's funny is uh, just not to get too far off track here, but um, because I have a couple other things that uh, I think I should probably uh, clear up there. But um, what uh, some time ago I thought about this, and I thought, you know, here you go. Why, you know, people wonder why? Why uh, did Noah and 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 quite a few other people back then allegedly live that almost a thousand years, or possibly even longer than a thousand years before that? Um, and then it dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. Well, you know, I can't say with any certainty at all that why, but it, it would appear, you know, uh, looking at all the evidence as far as their need uh, for energy, um, that at times, or as this has been going, 
their need for whatever reason. Maybe they're building other holographic universes or building other things similar to it but not the same uh, for other captivity, uh, whatever, however you want to call it. Right? We don't know, but they have a, a, a greater, I, I, it seems to me they would have, they would have a greater need. And as uh, the need grows, our life expectancy dwindles. Um, and to just make sure everybody understands what I'm saying here is, uh, again, I, I, I go into it in depth in a book, but and I think we touched on it on the last show, that we are tethered. I call it, uh, you know, our tether uh, back to the creator, back to the macro soul of the creator, our micro portion souls are tethered. Their tether was cut, as we see, and I pointed out in the book of Enoch, that their tether was literally cut. So it appears to me, through the evidence, that they have been pirating through us that same energy source just to stay alive, or else they would just disappear at some point. So, uh, so that's what the, really this, the whole, this whole thing is about, is about unconsenting, to, to stop consenting to, uh, to all that, to, um, to their fear narratives, to their destruction narratives, because by unconsenting, it, it, um, it probably, and again, I showed a scientific proof of this, it dwindles our output of energy, uh, which comes right off the top of our head, as most people uh, uh, research us know, and it dwindles that to near nothing. And uh, I can't imagine what 50% of us doing this would do to them. It would be catastrophic to them. Uh, and again, I hypothesize in the book that doing that, uh, since they're so plugged in and know what's going on all the time, uh, that that is probably why you saw what happened in Noah's flood and other epochs before that being, you know, destroyed in other ways as uh, it is alleged. So, anyway, um, so I guess the next one I, 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 we were talking about that people didn't understand was soul fear. So I'm going to get into that and give a mm. description of that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the soul fear um, is a, I coined years ago, and that's pretty simple. It's just um, a person who has already uh, assimilated the, the imposed or previously imposed life narratives, uh, usually religious, uh, which ber with, and they work both uh, at the conscious and subconscious levels to inhibit our conscious choice, uh, to basically to seek out other information that may conflict uh, with the chosen narrative that uh, we believe. You know, so, and I think we've all seen that. I mean, you, <laughs> you try to show any, I, I, I've, I've shown people things in black and white. You know, here's what it absolutely says, and I can show it to you, and you will have a seemingly intelligent person who you, you thought was moderately intelligent uh, previously uh, completely just ignoring it and, and staying on their track, uh, you know, on, on their paradigm, because uh, uh, that, that, that absolute fear of breaking from it um, for many reasons. And, in, in you know, my experience has been mostly with Christians. And, uh, you know, I mean, the idea of in any way somehow feeling that they're disconnecting from some uh, how do they put it? Uh, some kind of savior entity yeah, we call it the. Well, I, we actually call that savior programs. That's the, and I've talked about that a lot because that has a thousand iterations, streaming out, especially now on the internet. All kinds of savior programs. Okay, okay, that's uh, yeah, and I guess you know it's uh, you know with all the Christians I've I've, I've deprogrammed. Let's call it that. It isn't even um, just the Christians, though, Shamil. It, it, it is now emanating from a thousand points of light to. <laughs> quote George Bush, I mean, because it has gone into uh, savior programs that have to do with the monetary system, savior programs from UFOs and extraterrestrials, extra dimensionals. I mean, there's a thousand of these things running out there simultaneously now. Right, right. And again, all the narratives are always, uh, you know, you started with your, 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 
Hey, they really didn't like that one. <laughs> I was going to say, wait. <laughs> Holy shit. Have... Drop kicked. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the the only, I guess the next thing, just to move this on so we can get into, I guess, the, the meat of this project, but uh, some people, you know, and, and the people that gave me this feedback, uh, were saying that the people that they've, that have read the book and the other people that, that they've talked to uh, have been really freaked out by the holographic idea and that science supports it, which I guess really freaked them out, which is exactly why I put the science in there, because... Again, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have that impact if it was just you thought it was my opinion. So, but uh, so I guess I have to kind of touch on that because uh, on on and she sent me back. Uh, this one woman sent me back some ideas and and said, look, you know, this person I talked to, this person I talked to said, uh, you know, this this kind of freaked them out. And why would God do this? And why would God, you know, and all this. So, and and you know, I always break it down, keep it real simple because everyone has a tendency to, like I use, I call it just, you know, super spiritualize everything and, and, uh, and, and not really think about the greater picture or have the ability to think about the greater picture because they don't have the information in them. That's, that's what I find in most people. So, you know, a lot of opinion without, uh, w- without uh, investigation. So as far as the holographic creation space, I call it creation space idea, um, I guess the first point I have to say, uh, I have to hit on would, would be, that the creator, you know, the way, the way the creator, the prime creator, the true creator, creates everything is really none of our concern. You know, I, I you know, I, uh, people, uh, that is, that's the main thing I, I've really hit on people through the years teaching them is, is, uh, you know, uh, you know, why this is, why is that, you, you know, look, it's not there for you to know. So stop thinking about it. It's, it, you know, certain things you're just not going to know yet. Um, so it doesn't make sense to dwell on them, and it sure doesn't make sense to form an opinion about them when when there's literally no information of why something acted or did something a certain way. So uh, you know, I, it it almost seems like I'm reprimanding a child, but it it, it it's just you got to break it down very simply, and it it just doesn't. It's not our concern, you know. If it's if it's a super holographic matter based reality then that's what it is it it's just what it, it doesn't matter because if you were in your uh in your original form in your in your light body well then matter wouldn't matter <laughs> you know i mean it, 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 it the chair you're sitting on whatever it wouldn't matter anymore it's so you wouldn't be worried about what you you know you wouldn't be worried about that question so it, well, I, I think that a lot of that is deflection away from the core issue yeah. of not understanding the principles involved. In other words, most people do um, the the constant circular motion. If God, you know, who created God and who created that God and who created that God, it's an infinite loop, which just takes you into a mind space where you never really get beyond uh, a question that you you don't have the perspective to even address. You know, we're not addressing on the existential level the existence of a creator and his creative process so much as the functions of the creative process that we're now living in, which is within our pay grade as, as far as I see it. Yeah, uh, y- you know, and, 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 you know, another thing that she was saying was, uh, the question has come up, and I know it's come up to me too. Is is, is why if if we were, you know, when when people read things I've written, and I go back to Genesis, early Genesis, and, mm-hmm. and the alleged Garden of Eden, and all this, uh, you know, and they're asking, well, why why if we were light bodies and <clears throat> whatever that is, because I don't remember it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, why would we need trees and and rocks and ground and mountains and why would we need a physical holographic reality? And, you know, again, I mean, we don't really know, but it, it, it seems like to me, you know, just off the top of my head, uh, it seems to me that it'd be a perfect way for a light being entities uh, who probably have the ability to interact with physicality um, 
it, it seems like it's a perfect way to experience an innumerable, innumerable variety of, of existences, you know. Uh, but, you know, just like I, I was saying, I, I wrote back to you, as, you know, just as like uh, with any uh, theme park or vacation resort, uh, you know, there's hard, fast rules uh, in any creation, uh, of, upon many creations, which is, again, is something uh, I have shown to Jews and, and, and Christians in the text. That if, that if you're going to believe that text as, you know, some kind of hard, fast text that, that was God-given, uh, however then here's what it says. And I have proven through the text that it very clearly says that he has created many and continues to create many of these creations for whatever reason. And probably, uh, you know, when you're not captured like we are, uh, you're probably able to go to any of them. And you're also able to interact because you're a soul being that is able to create. And, And I go into that in the book on many levels and why there's different levels like we were talking about security clearances and 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 that you can only go to this area or this one or that one because you can only be trusted within this one or that one at your level of you know whatever you want to call it wisdom understanding so uh no matter where you go though there's going to be hard fast rules you know and and so if you want to think of these creations these holographic creations as theme parks uh, that's probably a perfectly fine way to look at it uh, they're they're vacation resorts. They're different and probably endless various creations for us to check out, which you know uh, I think would be just beyond incredible. So, but there's hard fast rules, and somebody broke those rules, and probably why we're locked in here because we consented to breaking those rules. As I go into it, so uh, you know the, this is the the creator's way of creating. Uh, seems to be that it's uh, it creates making super matter based hologram realities you know that uh, it's not intrinsically negative in its in, in its original form it shouldn't be scary to people uh, it I guess their I guess more of their fear might be coming from not knowing not understanding uh, only understanding what they think they understand about holograms you know which is again something I go into the book uh, quite a bit in, in depth to show people and teach them what the differences are. Well, I think so, a lot of it is the shift that we've been in. You know, I mean, we lived with the Newtonian universe for hundreds of years, and then in the 20th century, we sort of got drop kicked into the Einsteinian models. Those models didn't last 50 years before, you know, Carl Pribram and David Bohm and others came along and began to expound on this holographic model. So, you, you, you know, in one sense, because to the human narrative has been, I guess, kind of sped up, we're still grappling again with this kind of existential abyss of, of what this holographic model is. I mean, it, it's, it's relatively new in human understanding, even though it's actually a really old concept. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and I show you those um proofs in the book, right, uh, in different uh, Gnostic and other um, later uh, philosophers and stuff who, who really, you know, blow your mind when you read the stuff they they wrote and the ideas they had, uh, and they're trying to explain what's coming into their consciousness through the very limited vocabulary they had at that time. And it's just amazing to me, but I, I won't go into that. But it's it, you're right; it's been around for quite a while. And and I think what scares people, and I again, I gave this explanation in the book I, 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 more than once, because I I've I've never heard anyone explain to me, uh, but. This is the way, only way I think it can be explained, and, and I think why people freak out when you say it's holographic, it's not there. It is there. Um, and it's probably important before we continue to, that, that people hear this and, 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 and remember it, because, uh, because I know they're going on their, their, their limited ideas of what a hologram is, what they see on TV or what they, you know, what, what they've seen before uh, as holograms. And, and 
there's a reason why out the holograms that we produce are not physical. They're not matter based the way in the same frequency that we are. So it's really important to understand that the reason we, we can't physically interact with the holograms that we create now ourselves is because we are the creative source. That meaning being the creative source creative source, we're existing outside of the hologram that we created. Okay, so... So if I understand what you're saying, basically what we're doing is we're interacting holographically with a subset of another holographic system that sits above us. In other words, we've replicated, but we've not replicated in a way that we interact with it on the same level, the same plane as we exist on ourselves. It's, it's, it's a... Right, we're, we're, we create a hologram. We're outside the creation. Yes. That's why we, we can't physically interact with it. Okay, so that's why. If, if we were somehow probably able to, <laughs> you know, on a, on a Ray Kurzweil level, uh, interject our, our soul, our consciousness, uh, into uh, the hologram that we just created then yeah we would be able to interact on the same level you know with that with that hologram so uh that's why because we're outside of what we created and it's not the same so um i think i don't know i i, I think it might be relevant to some christians someone told me uh read me uh, one of the New Testament things a long time ago story uh, and I remember it loosely about someone being in prison I, you know who knows if any of this is even remotely accurate or real but that, that someone was in prison one of the apostles I believe or somebody and um, somehow uh, so, someone else showed up they, they want to call it an angel okay mm -hmm. and uh, The, the guy that was being uh, extricated was at a prison was, I guess, chained to the floor or the wall. And right, right, they, yeah. And suddenly the chains just fell through him or off him, and then they were able to walk through the walls and pass the guards and pass everybody. Well, it's amazing when I heard that because I thought, well, all right, uh, whoever this other being was obviously has a technological ability to not only... Um, shift his phase just enough, his physicality just enough to possibly still be seen, uh, but also shift the phase of the other physical human to a certain degree, shift his frequency, so that the physicalities around him were no longer solid to him and so in other words maybe he's shifting his holographic substance all right his matter-based substance shifting the frequency just enough that's that's how i took it when i read that you know when i heard that and uh i think we read it later because i was pretty intrigued by it i can't remember what it was but or what book it was in or who and that's who actually was. a narrative that comes out of the book of acts and i believe it was peter who was in being imprisoned at the time in rome and the angel came in and basically he was he was he's basically supernaturally translated out of his chains and out of the prison so so okay, I, so, I do, so that, yeah, I mean that's a narrative that's there, and it makes a great deal of sense in terms of the manifestation of what you would consider to be an angelic um, miracle, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the book, I go into different uh, variations on that theme, like um, you know, when people see allegedly see ghosts, are they actually seeing ghosts, or are they? Are they seeing the physicality of another person in another creation that's 
next to ours, because if you look at the tree of life the, in the in the uh, <clears throat> Hebrew or the Jewish uh, understanding of it, when you look when you look at that, and and uh, I wrote a paper on this uh, that I should probably send you, but I believe that that tree of life laid over flat and then layered top and bottom more and more is actually showing and the flower of life picture also is actually showing multitudes of of what people would call flat earth creations domed flat earth creations next to each other almost touching each other and that creates an uh an, a never-ending flower of life out in all directions and then also others above and others below there you have your levels of creation and that if two are you know circles are touching or near touching possibly the frequency uh, at some time or space possibly overlapping uh, now you might be thinking multiverse or whatever um, that you're actually seeing another person mm-hmm. in another cre- mm-hmm. yes okay but because the frequency is just shifted just slightly enough, you're able to see them, but you're not able to see them as a solid physicality. It, to you, it looks like a ghost or, or apparition or what you might call a hologram. And then what I think happens is to them, they're seeing the same thing. See, they think they're seeing a ghost uh, or, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. So uh, I, I also... So this is what that. you what we would call... I mean, in electrical engineering, that's called being out of phase. I mean, there are, there's two currents, but they're out of phase. One exists and the other exists, but they are not operating in phase with each other. And that's exactly the term that I think you use as well. Right. And, and if you look, you know, the human physicality, our human physicality, is only able to see or perceive from within a specific and very narrow frequency range of the light spectrum. So, you know, we believe we're seeing everything that exists in our, <laughs> you know, but you know, I know we we aren't. So, uh, and that's and I think that's what these archons are also playing on. That when other when all these people that are into the UFOs for the for the sake of UFOs, uh, believing that there's still planets out there, believing that these are coming from other planets, the way the way we've been uh, indoctrinated to believe our planet looks and other planets look as spheres and. We're, we're indoctrinated to believe that, and, and so you have these people, and they're totally in, into the whole UFO thing, thinking that these are other entities from other places, but, you know, I go into it again in the book quite a bit about how they're not. Uh, yes, they might be from slightly other places, but I'm going to say they're from other frequencies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're extra, well, we'll call them extra dimensionals. I mean, look, you know... Yeah. You know that I've interviewed a lot of these people over the years, and I've even had my own experiences with these things, and it's very frightening um, to contemplate, you know, what you're dealing with in terms of these entities, but at the same time, they take on this archontic, godlike aura as well, to the point where people have actually, well, literally, people have turned this into a religion, quite literally, going back to George Adamski back in the 40s. Right, and that's what we do. You know, that's what we do because we've been indoctrinated, we've been programmed to do that with everything. So it's, but in from my perspective, how I put it in the book, that these are not just entities that just willy-nilly have been created by the creator and have been, uh, you know, on other planets and, you know, coming here because they're interested. Um, I I go into the details and the proofs that, uh, they're actually created by the archons themselves. And I won't give it away too much of what else they created. Mm, yeah. You know, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the book. But they, uh, they created them, and they're using them as, in like our modern parlance, we call them cutouts. Uh, they're cutouts. They're they're being they're 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 used. They're they're entities that have been produced specifically and using technology, so they're not seen uh, specifically to interact with us. Why? To create yet another massive narrative, possibly the last narrative. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I agree with you on that one. 
Yeah, yeah poss- possibly the last narrative, possibly the one, you know, and that's where we start getting into the disclosure now of the holographic universe from what we were talking about uh, earlier a week or two ago uh, from Merrill Lynch and, and, and others high up in the, in the science and government are now, you know, now, now I didn't expect it to happen so soon. When I wrote the book, I thought, you know, many years from now, possibly 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, based on what Ray Kurzweil and, 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 uh, people like, uh, Elon Musk, Bill Joy and people like that, that they, that they get into this whole transhumanist thing and, I, I thought it was a little further off in the future, not maybe not too far, but uh, you know, a little further up. But they're, you know, boom, they're here now. They're they're uh, they're suddenly coming out with this this disclosure, and I I think it's premature. I think it's possibly because they're up against it. Uh, I think the what I've been seeing, I I, I know I've been seeing this this uh, illumination, if you want to call it, or this uh, uh, people uh, becoming aware. Of far more than uh, they 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 ever thought they would become aware of, and uh, and that awareness is is uh, again pulling energy uh, from the mouths of of these of these Arconian uh, you know overlords, and uh, yeah, so that that that's hurting them, and uh, so I think this disclosure might be a little premature, but. Uh, I think that's what we're seeing now. I don't so, think they have a lot of choice at this point because. The level, okay, so, you know, on one level, we're kind of in the hundredth monkey effect that, you know, there's a, there is now a groundswell. It's not a large number. It runs somewhere about one to three percent of the total population of the planet. Those are my numbers. Just based on straw polls and the the sense I get the pulse of people. But this article that came out on businessinsider.com. You know, there's a number of things that are going on with this. And and first off, you know, we're talking about Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, a very large, a very corrupt financial organization. I mean, Bank of America is one of the largest major banks responsible for, for laundering drug money over the last 30 years. You know, that's not even speculation at this point. But these guys are in trouble. The The illusion of power has really fallen away since 2008 when the banking system started to tank. And they're looking at all of this now. And, you know, it needs to be said, and I know that you've, you've gone into this as well, our banking system is a religious institution. You just look at the, the institutions themselves, their temples. You know, they, they have a teller, a confessor, a priest. They have a money system, a power system. They have books. They have ledgers. They have laws. This is in and of itself a religious system, and it's a hypnotic religious system that binds us to the energy levels of a false, another false narrative, another banking system. The banking system is a false narrative. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Ma- one, one. Go ahead. So, so Merrill Lynch comes out with this article and it's it's September 8th 2016 and I see this article I sent it to you and I'm like holy shit you know look what they're talking about this is not some UFO uh, tinfoil hat website this is a major online business publication and this is a publication being put out by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, talking about future reality, the fact that, as they say, <clears throat> quote, there's a 20 to 50 percent chance we're inside the matrix and reality is just a simulation. I mean, it's kind of like well, 20 to 50 percent is a pretty big spread. You know, if you're running a 30 per 30 percent spread on anything, that's kind of like a horse race. So what are they really saying here? They're 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 kind of. They're kind of hedging everything inside of that headline to tell you the truth that when you take the numbers away, we're inside the matrix and reality is just a simulation. Boom. Right. And they're going to start acting more accordingly. That's how I. Yeah. But they already have. I mean, essentially, when you talk about a simulation, that's what you're talking about. The banking system. It's a money system that's based on nothing. Hypothecation, right. hypothecation of, of, of individual debt. Right. And I, I liked, 
in that email you sent me, you you said you know uh, is, uh, is or I, don't, I, th- I thought it was you unless it was them and I missed it. But it, it, uh, it you said uh, is the machine self aware or is this hypnosis inside the machine? And and that really cracked me up because in the book I go into that and that's why when I wrote you back in that email I said oh my god you know that portion of the book it's almost like it's prophetic because you know two years ago I'm writing that section and it, it if I remember correctly and, and and I hypothesized that someday you know I said that uh, uh, that they will um, come out and and with this disclosure uh, about the reality of this place, the reality of us, uh, but only because, you know, they intend to prove uh, the true reality, uh, uh, how, you know, in how the the eternal creator created this place and other places, but they're going to disclose it and try to, and, and, and try to prove it in a very skewed light, in a, in a different way. Um, because it, it works for them, you know, uh, because they're the ones that, you know, ultimately took adverse possess- possession you know, of this place. So the, 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 the archons, the ones in control of the banks and everybody else that's up high like that, and I'm sure there's people up high that are actually in direct contact with these entities on some level, however they're shown, they show themselves to humans, but... Uh, you know, possibly in a little gray form, you know. But, 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 and then uh, the other side of that is, you know, these business systems are all based on the Masonic system, where once you get above a certain level inside the Masonic system, of course they're in contact with the entities, because that is just simply another occult religious worship system, and that's what the entities themselves set up. You know, when I say banks are a religious structure, I'm, I mean that literally. And I also mean that they are aligned with major occult forces. You know, largely in banking, what you have is, is Freemasonry. It goes much deeper than that. But on a surface level, I could point you to any number of organizations and individuals and tell you with great certainty that they are they are part of the, the, the Masonic hierarchy that runs the business structures. I know that from being in the business world. Right. But, but see, all of this, um, again, breaking it down to its absolute basic core and simplicity, <clears throat> because from the beginning of this operation to the end, it's not about anything that's been done in the middle. It's only been about the soul. It's been about the capture of the soul for a time, and it's been about the capture of the soul for eternity if possible. And that's why I said in the book that someday they're going to disclose. That's why I was so shocked to read that, that article. I, know, I, I, I always follow the science, and the scientists, and more and more and more scientists are, are signing on to the holographic uh, universe uh, uh, hypothesis and, and all this and and proving I, I as far as I'm concerned they proved it so but the the key here is they're not going to disclose what it truly is and why it truly is and how it truly is they're they're going to disclose just enough to say it's holographic and then give you the science behind what a holographic matter based Reality is, but, you know, really the end game and how I see the bigger picture, and, and I think this is exceedingly important, um, is that really their end game and how they're going to prove it is going to be proved, they're going to prove their version of it, you know, this, this, of this created space. They're, they're not going to prove the creator's version of it and go backwards and say, well, this is how it was, and, you know, uh, by your consent and by your ability to collective uh, power up and and, uh, and 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 change things uh, in in the way we want to see them change through our narratives, uh, we created it. You know, we're not, not going to say that. They're they're just going to give you enough information, tell you the science behind it, uh, let people like Bank of America and other. Uh, people, as it goes, are going to disclose more and more. And why, though? Because they're going to disclose it 
And they're only going to disclose their version of their skewed version of it, of this created what I call the hollow verse. Uh, and for the sole reason, or more accurately, the sole reason, S O U L, sole reason, uh, more accurately, they're going to do it uh, in order to convince. Uh, and this is the important part. I believe they're going to do it uh, to convince people, souls, by some reasoning that we all must you know, allow ourselves, our consciousness, our souls, to be removed from these physical bodies and uploaded into a new created mm -hmm. space. Yes. You know, yeah. uh, their, their, their long expected alleged ascension. And so if, if there was going to be an ascension to the fifth dimension or whatever, back to where we were, for whatever reason, it would only be because our captivity was broken somehow, not because they allowed it. Right. It would only be because the captivity was broken somehow. And however that works out, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, how the Christians believe it'll work out or, <laughs> you know, who comes back to save us or nobody does. Or it's how I say it's going to happen by people returning uh, and, and breaking that breaking those chains that they put on themselves themselves. They have to take them off themselves. So, uh, you know, I think that's going to be the greatest lie. That's going to be the grand illusion that everybody... <laughs> it is the grand illusion. And it goes into this whole digital space thing, you know, the singularity of what people like Elon Musk have been talking about. And we're going to play a clip here in a minute or so that will help bring some of this out. But, I mean, in this article, which this is the controlled narrative, I mean, to me, this article was just like, it was like I woke up one day and somebody handed me the narrative on a platter. So you have Nick Bostrom, and this is a paper that Bostrom wrote, I want to say back in the 2003, I believe, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? Um, and this is a scholarly work, but the way this article spins it is you have three possible scenarios. One, extinction before reaching a, quote, post-human stage, which is right. your fear narrative. Reaching right. post-human existence but not simulating evolutionary history. Well, that goes into the myth of evolution itself, but that's a stasis. And then three, we're already in the matrix already. All of these are a narrative designed to confine us inside of their matrix system, which is our banking system is screwed. We need to extract more energy from you, capitulate, collapse, and become digital. Right. In other words, you know, the, another great flood in a different direction. But, it, but it, it, it's, I, I think it's even more than that, unless I'm not quite getting everything you're saying, uh, because... They seem, I think that they're going to use some a massive fear narrative. I think, um, I think I heard, I don't know if it was Elon Musk or someone saying that, you know, this world is dying and that, hmm. it, it, you know, cause of a dying world, you know, rather than all of us just disappearing into the great nothingness, uh, that, that we should upload our, our consciousness, which Kurzweil says has been, you know, is available. Uh, and I, I believe it is, to upload the actual energy of the soul, the plasma-based energy of the soul, into some type of, I don't know, quantum computer system or whatever they're working on. Um, I don't believe for a second that even if you did that, um, got that chip in your brain or whatever and, you know, what, and, and somehow uploaded... Um, that made no sense to me either because there's still a physical connection. There's a chip in the physical brain that is allegedly allowing the soul to be uploaded into their system. Well, once the soul is out of the body, as I contend in the book and show through the different sciences, there is no body. The body dies. Without the soul, the body is, un, uh, is unanimated. So... Um, it, that made no sense to me either. If they put a chip in you and then y your soul gets uploaded, well, then the body dies. The chip is no good anymore. Maybe it was just a transferred device. I'm not exactly sure how they would go about something like that. I've been kind of mulling it over, trying to uh, wrap my head around how they would do that. But the long and short of it is, we both know, that's where they think they're going. That's where they want to go. And I think they're going to use some 
massive war or some kind of fear narrative or fear narrative of a dying planet after war. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, to get everyone to just say, yeah, I, I, I want to live forever in, you know, in this and that. But, it, but see, whatever they build, just like I was saying before, whatever we build, if, if we build and we make uh, the greatest um, – uh, hologram, like you've seen uh, singing on stage, a couple of different holograms singing on stage, where you, you virtually cannot tell They're, that person's. You know, we know he's long dead, but there he is. You know, and we're watching him. Twenty thousand people are watching this guy on stage. I saw it. It, it is. It is really good technology, uh, but again, um, you can't physically interact with it because. You're not. You're the creator. So they're the creators of this of, of this whatever they've created. They think they've created a quantum computer, possibly, or something else. Again, technology that they derive from their archon handlers. So whatever they have, uh, the end game seems to me. My opinion is that it, it, it is to finally, for once and for all, uh, contain all that soul energy to contain all those souls. And once you get there, it's not going to be what they're saying it's going to be, obviously. It's, you know, when you listen to that uh, the Elon Musk, you know, uh, who's just another Shellanite, and if you read my first books, they'll find out what a Shellanite is. Uh, you know, his, when you look at him, he say, well, you know, you're going to be able to do whatever you want or be whoever you never die, you never get sick, it'll be perfect reality, blah, 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 blah. Now... We don't know because we've never had our souls captured inside of a, of a, of a machine before, as far as we know. Um, you know, I know, like you said, a lot of people are saying, well, is this reality the false reality? Yeah, I, I can't say it's not. I mean, well, I, I, you know, my argument has been, and I've been on a number of panels, uh, TV, doing TV and radio shows, but my argument has been that yes in some way we have been held captive in inside of a system but there's two points that i argue about this and they're the points that you make in your book as well one a long time ago we signed on to this we did give consent we have an ongoing consent form on file as souls and two it appears as though at least within some component of the collective there's an awareness and a self-awareness of captivity, which means we are not captive. If the awareness of captivity is, in fact, the initiating force to be free from captivity. Ultimate captivity right. would be you do not know that you're inside of a system. Right, right. And, and uh, you know, for me, uh, especially uh, since I was very young, I, you know, I've been on that course. So... Yeah, exactly. You see, and these are the ideas that people don't, they don't go as far as they need to go when, when they're thinking about this stuff. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not, you, we might be passively captive right now, um, like I point out in the book. But it's only because of our consent. And we do have a way to return. Uh, to the creator, to our original existence eventually. So, like you say, this is not, um, this, this, this isn't the actual prison. The next one will be. Yeah, it will uh, be. Let's, let's play this clip from, um, this is a clip that you sent me email this weekend, and this is an excerpt from the um, October 7th Alex Jones show. And what you're going to hear is uh, a number of narratives that then we'll come back and, and talk about a little bit. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this as I play this. Secretly engaged scientists to work on breaking us out of the simulation, Altman told The New Yorker. Elon Musk thinks it's almost inevitable that civilization as we know it is actually just one giant simulation. 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were at. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll have you know, virtual reality, 
of augmented reality, um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. The odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. So Tell me what's wrong with that argument. He also said that that's probably a good thing, because the alternative is the complete destruction of humanity. E either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality, or civilization will cease to exist. And if our brains and our impulses are completely simulated, breaking out of the matrix, as these billionaires are pushing for, would mean ceasing to exist. Innumerable scientists, physicists, and futurists agree that it's almost certain the universe is a simulation. If simulating universes becomes a pastime uh, among those who have access to high powerful, to highly powerful computers, and we are in a universe, we are probably in a simulated universe, even if one of those universes is actually real. This universe could have been created by... Hey, pause. Uh, we're going to come back and play the last few minutes of and go to your phone calls and see well, but it just hit me. Can you imagine, Lucifer, sitting around telling people just like this over communication systems, whenever, and you're going to be gods, and this whole thing's fake in a simulation, and so, yeah, you weren't really created by this. Let's break out and build our own thing. I mean, whether the devil's real or not, we are witnessing unified academics, all of them going, my children, it's all fake. It, none of it's real. Join us. Wires in your head. Oh, 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 it feels so good now. And, 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 and you look at the cult like this, they all have this weird look at their face like they just say, ah, oh, children, it's time to merge with the other brain. Oh, the UN is going to sponsor Zeitgeist Movement. A robot will tell us what to do. Computers, look at old man. He made neat models and painted things. He'll teach us about collectivism run by robots. Oh, robots, love me. And then who runs the robots? Who programs them? So Paul Watson's report is up on InfoWars.com. This is something we've talked about for so long. And now, though, they've gone operational. We'll just... Right side, and as many of you know, I'm on a mission to help. Uh, give your. You're listening. His press conferences. I mean, you know, so even if one of those universes, God, let's finish the clip. Simulating universes becomes a pastime uh, among those who have access to high powerful to highly powerful computers and we are in a universe we are probably in a simulated universe even if one of those universes is actually real this universe could have been created by some super intelligence in another universe so so maybe we're the whole, our whole universe is a junior high school science experiment of some super intelligent junior high because you're god right here as well you know everything right Maybe she won't get such a good grade. You guys sit around listening to me. I know everything. But Richard Dawkins isn't convinced. When you make a simulated world, yeah. and, and, and there are, I mean, there are crude ones like Second Life, yeah. um, there has to be a, a physics built into it. Yes. Um, and, and when you drop things, they fall, and when you throw them up and catch them, it works. But you can violate that physics. I mean, the, sim the, the, the pimply youth doing the simulation can some, somehow just it, at, at, at will change the physics and you could suddenly fly as you indeed you can in in second life we don't see that another argument is that civilizations never become advanced enough to make simulations before wiping themselves out therefore it's impossible but the characteristics of quantum mechanics are exactly what we would expect to see in a simulation there's a limit to the resolution with which we can observe the universe it just becomes fuzzy like pixels on a tv screen if you get too close again suggesting that we could be trapped inside a complex video game subatomic particles like quarks also resemble the codes that correct for errors in computers. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos. Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. You might feel denigrated that your life is just a character in a video game, that we have no real free will and that our behavior is programmed. But think of it this way. If our civilization is a computer simulation, if we're all living in the matrix, at least it means we have a creator.
Wow. Okay, so that clip was a little longer than I wanted to play, but you get the taste for it. Shamil, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I did hear that the other day. Um, and actually, um, from because I have a friend that listens to that guy ritually uh, and, and sends me quite a, a few video clips a week uh, that he deems are important and because... He's a smart guy. I listen to him, and, and I unfortunately have to listen to Alex Jones uh, more than I probably want to. I've never once ever in since the 90s have heard him once. I might have missed it, but I've never heard him once talk about it, any of this. Uh, it, it should also be uh, known that oh, a week or so after my book originally came out, uh, he was sent one of my books. So a lot of that could have been... Uh, uh, that could have been a launching pad for what, which is good. If, if they're going to start talking about this now, that's excellent. Um, and I think in that clip somewhere, he also talked about that Merrill Lynch. Um, I'm pretty sure I, when I listened to that. Yes, today, he did reference it. I don't think he referenced it directly, but he did reference it himself. Yes. Yeah, he yeah. did reference. So it they're himself. watching this stuff, you know, and I don't know if Alex has talked about this before, because like you, I don't listen to him except when people send me something that he says, you know, and then right. as we talked about earlier, the thing about it is on one breath, he's talking about this and he's talking about it accurately. And then he goes into his other mode and we're back to Donald Trump again. And, and, and this whole political sphere, which is, you know, that's that's the false narrative on steroids right there. Right. And, and like I've said to my friend that sends me these clips, uh, I've told him from years ago, I've told me he, he's now somewhat convinced that I'm correct that Jones is, is definitely working with the other side. Yes, and, yeah. We, we've reached that conclusion on this program as well. Yeah, and, 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 and my friend said, well, you know, he talks about this, talks about that, it doesn't make sense. And I, and I told my friend, I said, listen, there are very important and very specific things that he never talks about. Even if it's happening in the news and other places and everybody else is talking about it, he will not talk about X, Y, and Z. I'll put my son's life on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he started listening, and he said, oh, crap, you're right. He said, he, 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 he goes, the other day, a caller called in and, uh, and uh, referenced uh, these people over there in the Middle East and uh, referenced them by name and referenced their security outfit and 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 uh, he said, Jones literally hung up on the guy. He goes, he literally hung up on him. I said, right. I said, that's one he won't touch. And so, just like the Merrill Lynch thing came out, right? And then here we have what a week or two later, you have this crackpot getting into it. Um, in 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 a lot of it was pretty long. It was in, in depth. They got into it pretty well um, and correctly, like you said. Uh, but again, why? Because that's what they want. They, they, they want this narrative to go out now. They, they want this. They have to control this narrative now because you know what? I might not be the only one talking about it to this level, writing about it on this level. There might be others. I don't know. It, it, but the level that I'm presenting, like you know, in, in the book, I, I think is probably fairly damaging to them. And uh, because when people are reading it, they're going, you know, it's freaking them out at first. They have to read it five times uh, because it's a lot. But they are coming back and saying, you know, wow, this is what then then what you said in the first book becomes so much more important. Uh, I didn't understand it was even that important, you know. And I don't even understand how they could not understand the first one was not that important. But <laughs> uh, evidently, this was needed. So. Yeah, it's good to be saying well, it. Well, you know, I, and then the other side of this is that they will toss you back into another false narrative. I mean, Jones shifts in his narrative here back and forth, but where he ultimately shifts you is the other side of the dialectic on this is back into the established religious narrative. There is a God. Right. It's the God of the Bible. 
I believe that, you know, and again, you know, your book dismantles a lot of that in a way that lets people understand, no, this is a false narrative also. That's why we're having these conversations and why I thought your work in this book specifically was important for people to understand because they do not understand the whole reformatting thing. They do not understand how they've been energetically looped in and out of this reality stream in endless cycles and had had their memories wiped like some kind of cosmic MK ultra operation. And all these <laughs> illusions have been put in front of them. So they shift, you know, and this is what people like Alex Jones do. They shift the narrative back and forth between several different controlled narratives in order to to keep people spinning inside of the loop. Right. And and, and like I said, like I said just, just earlier before that clip, the only reason for the disclosure, like you're saying about him, is that they're going to disclose it with truth but in a very skewed light, in a skewed way. Uh, so just like he's, he's disclosing it, but then what is he doing? He's not redistributing it, distributing it in a skewed way. What he's doing is then after he's done distributing it, uh, disclosing it, he's, uh, he's, he's, like you're saying, he's then, boom, right on the other track again, uh, connecting it to subliminally, uh, so he's making a suggestion. He's telling you, oh, this is what they're saying. This is what it is. And this is what they want to do to you. Da, 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 da. And then, oh, Donald Trump. We all got to vote for Donald Trump because this, that, and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, bang, right into that. And uh, when you connect the two together, you might even think, well, he's on to another topic. But, you know, subliminally, most people uh, kind of uh, digest that uh, as being one. Uh, like, like, so he, 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 I understand what you're saying. He's, he's, he's very, he's very good at that. He's very good at, at connecting things that they want connected, but you don't see, most people don't, won't understand as being connected when they walk away. They, they, they think they just heard two different topics, but, uh, but how they assimilate it and how they continue to think about it after the fact is not that way. And, and that's their magic. That's their magic. Their magic works on suggestion. You know, suggestion. Uh, surely you will not die. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so it, it works on suggestion. And, you know, uh, you know, there we are. I mean, we get, like we were talking about the Torah codes and, and other, other things like uh, I get into in the book, which, you know, I thought we might get into here. Uh same thing. It's it's more suggestion. It's uh, the web bots, the tour codes. It's 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 pretty amazing, really. When if you really start thinking about it, um, you know. And I, you know, I'm not new to the tour code thing. Um, I actually had on a floppy disk. I was actually given one of the earliest versions. Of that program, mm -hmm. yeah, I have one too. I got it back in the nineties. Yeah, back in the uh, uh, yeah, yeah, back in the early nineties, yeah. ninety two, ninety three, somewhere right in there. I got it from my brother, who's an Israeli, and he uh, he gave it to me, and uh, I, he got it from someone he knew specifically it's so old and, now that you have to run an emulator on a computer in order to run it because it was running on an early version of dos that's how old it right is. <laughs> yeah right that's 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 how old it is yeah I that's mean, my, a disc yeah. operating system for those of you out there who were weren't alive in the 90s mm -hmm. yep and it's uh so I've, I've had access to that for quite a while and and uh i have molded that over uh to the nth degree, and uh, you know the bottom line uh, with, with all of that, and uh, and I'm not sure how much more they're going to use it, um, but I have a pretty specific idea of how they're going to use it in the end, and uh, and but you know where when that end comes, I mean who knows? But the, well, you know the, the that, web the web bot. Um the Torah codes, you know, these are all forms of prophecy. 
and and um you know there's all all different aspects to prophecy you know predictive nature of things but and and if you know maybe what we can do to, when this show because we're you know well over 90 minutes into this and can't do it justice is kind of bait the hook on that subject for the next show and go into tour codes and the web bots and, and what that's all about because it's a pretty big subject and it, it, it plays into you know a lot of what you're writing about in soul revolution so maybe we can just kind of kind of park that there and develop that for for the next for the next episode sure yeah we could do that because yeah, I think we've it, given people a lot to chew on here. I mean, there's, you know, that hopefully the people that read, the, hear these shows, um, you know, have a certain level of maturity and are, are attempting to break out of this. I, I know that the people in your group, the people who are studying your materials are certainly there. And many of my listeners are as well. But, you know, our goal is to disseminate this out a little wider. So we give people... A fair amount of substance to chew on and sometimes it's disturbing and uh, I sense that certain aspects of this show are probably disturbing yeah I, I it always is you know it's it's just another level that people have to grow to um, uh, something you know like uh, what was it um, who was it I think it was Buddha uh, said something to the effect that um, you know you, you only uh, a person only misses or, or falls off the road of truth uh, either by not starting or by not finishing, you know, going all the way, and and that's that's a lot of what what we have with people, you know. I think and uh, you know when I start hitting on the alien subject, like you said, uh, that that might you know make a lot of people mad and. Well, only because they have bought into a paradigm that was uh, constructed specifically to do that. Um, like you said, no, it's a religion, no different than another religion. And I thought that was a very important part of my book, um, was I wasn't originally going to integrate that. And I did because, you know, you, you, have to, you have to know the ground around you tactically. You have to know who's in the prison, who's working from outside the fence to keep you there without you knowing, uh, how they're doing it, um, why they're doing it, and, and, and all these things, uh, all the elements. You, you really should listen and, and consider. Don't, don't get pissed off. Just sit back and say, well, all right, let me, let me, let me read this guy's book or let me consider it from this direction. Because, you know, maybe I have been lied to again. Because it's funny, because these same people will, you know, you talk to these uh, you know, hardcore UFO guys, which I've talked to before in, in the past about, about different things, the guys that have been on different shows. And it's funny, because, uh, like, we're talking about the banking and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, geopolitical stuff and whatever. We know it's all control. We know it's all contrived. We know it's all theater. We all we know it's, it's all going and, and being utilized uh, to herd the cattle into, you know, yet one more level of passive slavery and, uh, you know, by their own consent, which is the most important part. It always has to be by our consent uh, in this realm, uh, because this is, like you said, not uh, the original enslavement containment field. You know, this is this this was an original creation, like I say, has been reformatted into a containment field. So. But, you know, these the same people will, will believe all the things we, we've talked about on the, all these other levels. But as soon as you get into the, the other thing, you know, about the whether they're extra dimensionals or whether they're little grays or tall grays, like I say in the book, it doesn't matter. They, they get upset because they're, boom, you're stepping well, on yeah, there. It's like I always say to people, you were fine as long as I was goring somebody else's ox. But when I got to yours, you got real defensive. And sorry, that was kind of a bloody term there. But it kind of, you know, it gets the point across that we all have this, this we all have a paradigm that we're protecting. You know, I right. do. I have yep. paradigms that I've protected beyond reason at this point that I'm struggling with. I mean, cognitive dissonance kicks in because it's a protective mechanism for the things that you don't want to deal with. Right. And and like I said in my first book and probably all the other ones, because uh, half the time I can't remember what I wrote in a lot of these books, <laughs> uh, 
it's you know, I, don't, I, I generally don't read my own material. So after, after everything is, uh, you know, pours out of me, uh, it's it's done. I um, I've moved on. But we, the, you know, people will. Yeah, you're right. They'll they'll protect their their paradigm, their uh, their their sacred cow. Uh, but what I said in the, in the first book, I'm sure, is that. What, what, what I said to people, don't don't worry about, you know, when I prove to you that this is not what this says in your Bible, from the oldest Hebrew that exists, and I prove to you this is not what it says, and I prove to you this is not who he said he was, and this name does not mean this, and this is not the true name of God, of the true original God, and this is another God. When I start breaking that stuff down, and I do it to a point where there isn't a scholar on the planet that can turn around and say, oh, no, you're wrong about that. Because they can't prove it. And see, that's one thing my grandfather told me was, if, you, if you're going to teach, if you're going to prove these things to these people, you better go all the way back, much, much further than anyone else is willing to go spend much more time than anyone else is willing to spend. Because that's the only way. You'll prove it without an argument. And that's what I've always done. So when I tell people, look, just don't be afraid. Don't be freaked out because I know you're going to go out. And I always tell people, don't just take my word for it. Just because I wrote it in a book doesn't mean it's true, right? So go out now, now that you have a whole bunch of new information that I gave you. Go out and do your due diligence and search it out and search it out and learn the language as best you can and prove me wrong. And I have not had one person ever come back and say, well, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that. They've always come back and said, I didn't want this guy to be right, but I spent like a year at what, you know, looking, and I have a lot of smart people that I've taught, a lot of smart people, and, and uh, you know, with all kinds of credentials. And, uh, and they don't take my word for it, and I'm glad about that, because I told them that's what got them in trouble in the first place that you took some idiot's word for it, someone who didn't get taught, someone who didn't go back all the way, someone who was all about it's good enough. And it's not good enough because the, there could only be one truth. So you have to go all the way back through all the mythos, through all those myths, through all those superstitions, un- layer it as far back as you can go. Now, I know I haven't gone back as far as humanly possible because a lot of it has been stolen and hidden away still. But I am, from all my research, everything I know, I know that the stuff that they've hidden away is stuff that is going to absolutely prove what I've said to be absolutely true. That's why it's hidden away. Yeah. So, uh, and other people have said, I know I'm not the first, believe me, to, to, to tell people this. It's just that everyone that has has been killed in the past, and their stuff gets buried over, like, Probably this will, you know, but what I tell people is don't get freaked out by it, that you have to change your paradigm. Don't get freaked out when you go to try to prove me wrong and you prove me right over and over again, because the only thing you're losing is fake, is falsehoods. The only thing you have to delete is fake stuff. Why would you be upset about that? So... That, that's what I tell everybody. You know, when it comes to the alien stuff, whatever you want to believe, you knew, you know, these guys, they, like you, like we were just talking about, they, they can believe all these other things, but when you start talking about, oh, you know, they are aliens, they're from beta reticuli, and it's like, <laughs> dude, dude, wake up. There is no beta reticuli. There is no Mars. There is nothing out there the way you think it's out there. It's not, and it's not round, and it's not a certain distance away. Nothing out there is what you think it is. And you've been lied to. And, and I left a lot of that out of the book because as soon as you start getting into that, too many people who will not do the due diligence to find out where they live, what it's like, what's real about it, <laughs> they, won't, they won't look into it. To, you know, it's that whole flat earth thing, right? As soon as you say that... yeah. They're they're right there. There's the case study and the dialectic going on on the Internet right now. Another 
inserted narrative. I mean, we have the wars that are going on. And, f you know, Flat Earth is now a religion. It is a religion of epic proportions uh, on YouTube. And people have defended themselves. They have they have attacked other people. You know, so you have the round, the ball earthers, the flat earthers, and they're just warring it out right now, despite the simple statement of what Tesla said, that it is a realm and nobody ever bothers to look at that. So, you know, what we're experiencing right now is another version of just the, the, the medieval wars continuing in the 20th, 21st century. Yeah, to some degree, except the, the, the difference is, is that when you, when you really get real with it and you go back, you can only go back roughly 500 years right. to, to find anyone in any existence that ever was previous believes that this place was round. Mm -hmm. You can only go back 500 years. And 500 years ago, when, it, when, it, when, when that narrative popped up, there was no way to prove it. There was no way to prove it until the 70s, if you were able to prove it. And that's when all the lies really started blowing up. You know, and I, like, I've had a million people, you know, not a million, but I've had many people, you know, because I, I didn't even know that flat earth thing was blowing up. Uh, to me, it's academic, you know, but they, uh, you know, uh, just about a year ago, I started getting emails. Hey, you know, Dr. Asher, what what do you, what do you, what's your opinion on this? You know, on this whole, because this thing is really getting, it's out there and, you know, there's a lot of people showing these proofs and they, you know, and boy, it's very compelling, you know. So I started telling people, I said, look, I don't, I don't prove, I don't, I don't try to prove uh, that the earth is flat. I don't have to, I don't try to prove that. And they asked, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, here's what I can prove. I can prove it's not spinning. Mm -hmm. Others have others have proved it's not spinning. Mm -hmm. And I can prove it's not spinning. And therefore, if it's not spinning, then the other must be true. Period. Because the whole globe idea is one hundred percent based on a spinning globe. Not only a spinning globe, but then later it was added. It's not only spinning, but it's traversing through the universe at high speeds. And then not only that, but the other planets are spinning around us. So it's right. all spinning collectively. Right. It's, it's just, you know, it, it's like you got to be the biggest idiot on planet Earth, literally, to believe any of that. You, you have to be scientifically retarded to believe that. You know, me being, uh, you know, years ago, I uh, decided I wanted to learn how to fly. So, uh, back in uh, the East Coast, uh, in Jersey, I went to uh, I went to a flight school, big flight school, and uh, and I got a private pilot's license. I said, hey, you know what, that's that's good, but I want to, you know, that's just me. I want to go the whole way. So, I spent a lot of money and a couple of years, uh, off and on, and uh, I got a, a instrument rated commercial multi engine uh, ticket. Right, my license, and I have to say that getting all that within two years is uh, harder than any doctoral course at over eight years. It it was a lot of information, the physics, everything you have to learn to become that level of airline transport pilot. It's pretty damn vast, and anybody who's a pilot will tell you that's true. It's, it's a lot of information, and you better be very good at uh, uh, consuming and assimilating mass doses of information from various genres uh, quickly uh, to be able to go through a course, uh, what would be called an accelerated course, which is what I did. And I did it accelerated because I was doing many other things, teaching and stuff like that at the time, so I couldn't devote all my time to it uh, or that many years to it. So I, I just went through that and did that. And uh, it was at that time, not never really thinking about any of this too much before that, while landing, that uh, while landing a larger plane at about 200 miles an hour, uh, that the Earth wasn't spinning. And 
I remember the guy I was with, who was a, a top ATP pilot, uh, who, who was uh, checking me out on that particular aircraft. Uh, I mentioned that to him when we were taxiing. I said, you know, you ever think about it, that the, the Earth can't possibly be spinning like they've taught us it is. And he's like, what the heck are you talking about? Uh, he was a Norwegian guy, really great guy. And, uh, but, you know, very mainstream, very uh, cut and dry, black and white type. Uh, very, very left, 100%. He had, you know, his whole brain was left. And, uh, and I said to him, I, I said, you know, well, the Earth is allegedly at this, uh, at this uh, particular place on Earth is uh, spinning about you know, a little over 1,000 miles an hour, right? He says, yes, about 1,055. Okay, 1,055, whatever, 1,000 miles an hour. I said, so we just landed exactly east to west. So, you know, theoretically, I said, if the Earth was, say, spinning exactly uh, east to west, and we just landed, you know, uh, uh, on, on runway 180, uh, uh, which means I'm coming from uh, the north uh, to the south, uh, and we're landing exactly north and south, and the runway is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour uh, to my left, and I'm in the air, there's no way in physics that we're ever going to see that runway, ever, much less land on it. It's not going to happen. And he looked at me, he said, are you crazy? What the hell are you talking about? Would you shut the hell up? Just taxi and let's just get in. He just dismissed the whole thing what I said. But I said, I, and I, but you know, you know me. I can't stop. And I said, what are you talking? Are you an idiot? I said, are you an idiot? I said, we're well, both very good at math. I, I said, a thousand miles an hour. What's that? About twenty feet or uh, uh, twenty twenty miles a second? How am I going to land on that runway? I can't land on that runway. It's moving twenty miles in one second to my left. How am I going to land on that runway? And he said, shut the hell up. I don't want to hear any more of this. Cra-. And he just like locked up. And I was like, wow, man, I thought you were a smart guy. And I just kind of dropped it. And, and he was and our relationship was like kind of broken <laughs> from that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm from sure that point on. And I was like, man, you are like. And it, it was like an epiphany to me at that time. I was like, what the hell? You know, and I started then I started diving into it. I started looking, you know, and. I thought, wow, what, why, why would they tell us it's spinning? What, where did that come from? You know, that to me, that was like, uh, it almost hurt. I, w- I remember the feeling. I, I, I sat around quietly by myself thinking, what, I, am, I a, am I nuts? Am I wrong? And I started doing the math, and I started looking at it. I said, there's no way, no matter where you are on this planet, Unless you're sitting in a helicopter hovering, waiting for the, the, the runway to show up under you. And even that probably wouldn't work at that speed. Uh, I said, there, there's no way, you know, that, that that could be. And then other things started opening up after that. You know, I started, you know, once that opened up, forget it. I started looking at all this other stuff, but I never said it to anybody. So, I mean, for many years, I never brought this up to anybody. I never once talked about this this stuff because everybody is so closed off i thought oh my god they're closed off about the religion i try to talk to them about when i hit them with this they they, they literally almost slip into a, a coma you know and and i i thought wow this this is this is something is m- really wrong here m- much more than even my grandfather his father whoever 22 generations nobody ever brought any of this up you know so i i said this this, this, this is a problem here and i started think about but i i i I just i just crushed it down i just uh i said you know what doesn't matter but then about a year ago all these people started asking me so i told them i don't try to prove that it's flat i don't try to convince anybody of this or that i just tell you that it's not spinning and if it's not spinning then the other must be true end of it see i always try to break everything down to the absolute zero point the the absolute simplest way to understand it and to prove it because everybody tries to prove things with these grandiose theories and you don't have to do yeah that. no thanks for that because quite frankly my whole problem with the flat earth thing isn't that i don't believe there is a truth in what they're presenting my problem has been 
the means that they've used to present it and the lack of science, mathematics, and, and quite honestly, we're, we're, this is cognitive dissonance. We've been trained to believe a certain model. And I don't, look, unlike you, I am not good at mathematics. I suck at math. I, I'm, I'm very fundamental in, the, in that regard. So, you know, for somebody who can sit down and reason through all of this, I'm grateful. Well, you know, it's, uh, again, also look at, um, again, from flying, I, it, it hit me because after that day, I couldn't stop thinking about it to myself. Uh, then uh, as you go through training and everything, they, they, they literally teach you about every single piece of the aircraft. Every, you have to know how everything works down to the smallest detail, everything. Mm-hmm. Every mechanical thing, you have to understand how all of it works. So obviously they're teaching you about uh, you know your 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 gyros, okay, and so your gyroscopic instruments, um, and again I I've also yeah. even I I've also Go ahead. I've also heard I've also heard a, a naval guy uh, who who was in charge of the long range missile systems on I, I believe it was an Aegis or possibly a carrier I can't remember what it was uh, ship. Uh, say the same thing that he uh, I I knew this back in you know early eighties and uh, mid eighties <clears throat> I I came over that I thought holy crap that's that's an absolute physical proof that that it's not round because <clears throat> well two there, here's two things I thought of <clears throat> as I'm flying one thing uh, I I'll just jump off the subject of the of the gimbaled. Uh, 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 instruments. One thing that any professional pilot will tell you, uh, especially depending on where you learned, I learned, like I said, in the, in the East Coast, uh, New York, New Jersey area, JFK, all the big airports down Atlantic City. And man, when you were flying there, brother, your brain better be moving a thousand miles an hour faster than the earth, right? Because they are machine gunning information at you that you have to comply with in a nanosecond and not mess up. And if you mess up, you're on the ground, you got FAA all over you. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's probably the most difficult place on earth to learn how to fly. Uh, and any pilots coming out of there are probably the best pilots on earth, uh, commercial pilots. So it's, it's very strenuous. And one thing that they train you to do there, maybe everywhere, but definitely there, is maintaining altitude at all times. Now, the FAA regula- regulations at, to- at the time were to re- maintain your, your flight altitude, whatever it is, plus or minus 100 feet. <clears throat> you had to stay there. You know, matter, really, no matter what the wind's doing or whatever's going, you, you had to constantly be trimmed and monitoring your altitude constantly. And believe me, they're on your butt if you're drop 125 feet or go up a little too high, regardless what the conditions are. They are on your butt, you know, ATC's on your butt. The pilots, the Norwegian pilot that trained me at that, at that school, he was a maniac. Uh, he, you know, he, he, was, he was just a tiger. He was a tiger mom kind of a guy. And uh, he uh, would not pass you unless you were plus or minus 50 feet, half half what the FAA regulations were. And that was supremely difficult. It sounds like a lot of space, up or down, right? Uh, it's really not. You, you, can, you can sneeze and your aircraft could be down 50, 75 feet or up without even knowing it. So it's a constant maintaining of that altitude. It's a, it, you, are, you are vigorously... Uh, uh, attuned and 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 on on that that is that is one of the main things besides the other hundred things that you got going on all the time that is, that is one of the mainstays altitude <clears throat> so you trim your aircraft you know most weather's decent so you get up to a certain altitude you trim your aircraft you take your hands off especially if you're using uh, uh autopilot three axis autopilot or something like that so you're flying along now here's the problem the Earth's not that big. So the curvature on the size of this ball, alleged ball, um, 
when you're flying 300, 400 miles an hour, 350 miles an hour, something like that, and say the, the jets that we were flying at that time, uh, you would have to, and it hit me while I was flying, is that because of the curvature over just a small amount, six miles, 10 miles, and at 300 miles an hour, 10 miles, you know, boom, you're there. You're there. You know, your brain, when you learn to fly faster and faster planes, you have to learn to think further and further ahead mm -hmm. and anticipate what's coming up. You, you can't start thinking about it when you're there because that, by that time you're past it. So it, it's a whole thing. It's, it's, it's very difficult to learn at first. And, but if you're flying along and you say you're flying, say, whatever, 18,000 feet, 12,000 feet, and you're trimmed, perfect weather, you just trimmed to 12,000 feet. Well, in about six or 10 miles, you're not going to be at 12,000 feet anymore, AGL, above ground level. Because the Earth is falling away because it's round. So you would have to be like some kind of crazy trim master. Or airplanes would have to be literally designed completely differently in order to maintain even 100 feet up or down on a curved surface. That's pretty simple. Any idiot could, could put that picture in their mind, right? So yeah. now, now when you get to something like uh, your instruments, uh, all right, you're, you, you have uh, your gimbaled instruments, which, which are, uh, they won't work on a curve either because they, uh, as they tilt, all right, because as your airplane tilts, it stays level. It's always finding, it always finds its level. Right, right. Right, so your plane could be on a 40 degree angle, but but your 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 horizon indicator stuff and, and your, your, it's all, it finds level. And uh, that's, that's because that's, those gyros are, that's what they're meant to do. That's what a gyro does. Uh, but the problem is they're mechanical instruments. And those mechanical instruments uh, only tilt so far before they lock out. So <laughs> you wouldn't be able to fly around the earth in a big jet, you know, if you were using at that time, those type of instruments. Because your 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 gyro it would it would it wouldn't work. It it just it's not it physically it's it won't work. So your and gyros it, wouldn't work. You would not be able to maintain constant altitude on a ball earth. Or you wouldn't be able to land on something spinning that fast. Right. Even if, I mean, think about it this way, okay? You wouldn't need planes at all. If it's moving at a, at a thousand miles an hour, okay? And you're in yeah. LaGuardia, I, I get in it. New York. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is take your helicopter up to altitude and sit. And in yeah, you know, thousand miles an hour, three thousand miles, uh, roughly two and a half, two and three quarters hours. Uh, LAX should be right under you. So we went this far down this rabbit hole, and believe me, it's a rabbit hole that I've avoided because I don't feel I'm qualified to speak to the technical side of it. People have said it is a relative system, so that your helicopter theory doesn't work because gravity. This magical force called gravity somehow is the glue that holds all of this, these relative systems together. It almost seems like it's the, the crazy glue of physics that allows us to continue to humor ourselves with a ball or theory while at the same time being able to maintain the mechanics of what I guess you would call a, a, a plane. Right, but again, gravity, right off the bat, half the scientists in the world flat don't out don't know what it is. No, 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 no. Don't believe it. Half the scientists on this planet think the whole BS idea of gravity is exactly that BS. Now, all I need is a six foot ladder, a piece of paper, and a rubber ball, and I can prove gravity doesn't exist. So it. It's not gravity, it's density. Yeah, it's mass it, and velocity, basically. Yeah, mass, velocity is density that yeah. exists. So, so you're, you're standing on the ground because you weigh 200 pounds. That's why you're standing on the ground. And, you know, if you're a paratrooper, 
you're going to understand you're going to, one guy's going to fall faster than another guy. See, if gravity is a force, this is how I explain it to my son. If gravity is a force, then the force has to be constant, right? It's a force. The force has to be constant. It has to be constant on everything, whether it's a half a pound glass ashtray or a feather, it has to be constant or else it's not a force. Not, not, not in the way they're trying to make you believe it. It's, it's not, have you ever heard anyone explain to you that gravity was a force that, uh, that it's an intelligent force that it, it knows that a, a, a bird's. Yes. I've, I've heard it, but it's a ludicrous object. Look, I, I've you interviewed know, physicists and all kinds of scientists, and one of the standard questions, and this goes back 10, 12 years, has been, what the hell is gravity? What is it? Define it. What is the force? Because if it's a force, it has to come from somewhere. Where does gravity come from? Right. And if, and if it's a force, it has to act upon everything equally, the way they're trying to explain it. It's not a graduated force. It's not an intelligent force. It's not going to know a feather's light. Therefore, I'm going to let the feather fall a little slower than this brick. <laughs> okay, but this is the absolute and utter stupidity that 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 it becomes stupidity. It, to me, in my estimation, it becomes stupidity because the smart people get stuck in their paradigm so long, mm -hmm. you know, that that it literally becomes stupidity after a while. It's just like, look, man, I, I understand your PhD and you wrote all these papers about gravity and you're totally wrong. And you know, you're totally wrong, but, but now you're just defending it because you're afraid they're going to take your, you know, <laughs> doctorate away, you know? And it, so there's a lot of that going on. And, and that, you know, because there's been so much laid, these people bought into this stuff early on again, uh, believing stuff or having opinions with, 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 without searching, with, without identifying the truth first. They're, they're, they're believing what they learned in school. But so you're telling me that if I get up on this six or ten foot ladder and I drop a flat piece of paper and a rubber ball and the ball hits the ground first, then I get up on it again. And I crumple up the paper real tight into a ball and drop them both. And they both almost hit the ground exactly at the same time. That gravity knew I balled up the paper? No, it's density. It's density and aerodynamics. The difference is I balled up the paper and it fell through the atmosphere here in my house, which is thinner than the atmosphere at your house. And it fell about the same. Well, what you just described there, Shamil, actually is the principles of aerodynamics themselves. Why do we put wings on a plane? Right. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, when you described that, I was I, I had the picture in my head and I'm going, but, OK, so we haven't really thought through this very well, have we? <laughs> Nobody thinks through anything very well. They, it, that's the whole idea of, of the narratives. It's to get you early make you stupid, get you emotionally attached to it, then get you doctored in that, in that field so that even if you do wake up, you won't dare say a word, you know? I mean, I started talking up, uh, and, and I got in trouble uh, for it. And, uh, you know, my, it might go right, it might go to court at, at some day when I have the money to do that, you know, but they're bigger than me. And, oh. but that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. So, so those guys will be crushed. There's plenty of scientists out there that have been crushed from it. They've lost their credentials. They're, you know, they're blackballed. There's plenty of guys that have found human skulls that are, you know, dated to however old, and they're no different than a white guy's skull today. Well, they're like, well, how can that be? Well, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about that because we want to talk about only these other ones that look like, you know, Aboriginal, like early, early mm -hmm. Aboriginal yeah, you know, monkey yeah. ones, that, like like Lucy that we put together in, in different parts and pieces and told everybody was a person. Yeah, like the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, sort of stupid. It's it's, I, man, it's it's stupidity squared. It's it's people not 
the system ramps everybody up. Everybody's working two jobs. Everybody's working a lot. Everybody's doing this, and, and they want to be left alone. They're overtaxed. They're overworked. Uh, they don't have time to look at anything. And on top of that, you have the narratives driving them since they're born. And on top of that, you have other things that are put into their mouths since they're born, mm -hmm. which, again, I believe firewalls the soul even further. So you're, you're spiritually and mentally <clears throat> uh, inhibited from birth. Uh, and, and, you know, because that's what the system is and it's because the system needs to crunch it out a certain way. And, and that's what the book's about, and that's what we're talking about. So it is, it is pretty neat. So, I mean, just getting back to it, I don't prove the earth is flat. I prove it's not what you've been told it is. Therefore, the other must be true, and I don't care. I don't care if it's flat, if it's a freaking pyramid, or it's a ball. I don't care if it's hurling through space, going 10 miles an hour, 1,000 miles an hour. It doesn't matter to me because what the truth I know and the way I know to get out is far more important than the shape of this place. Mm. It is important, though. Because then people started asking me, because I didn't answer them, and I wouldn't give, you know, what I'm saying now to you, uh, I, w I wouldn't get into it. So they came back and said, well, then why? Why would anybody come up with that idea, you know, hundreds of years before it could be even remotely proven, and, uh, and then prove that what... That, that, that it is flat, but then continue to lie. To such a degree with NASA, with this, with that, I mean, space agencies worldwide, to, to continue that deception, why would they do that? It, it makes no sense. Why, why, and how would they do that? You know, how would they keep everybody, you know, and those are valid questions, uh, but again, I think it rolls back to the fact that oh, most people could be easily shut up because most of them don't ever find out. Just like the pilot I told the first day when we were landing and I came out with that, he shut me right out. So most people, even if somebody at NASA like me would come up and say to his colleagues, hey, you know what, I got this idea. You know, he'll be alone from there on, you know. I mean, so there's that. And then there's the doctor people, the people, the engineers, who don't want to ruffle the feathers, who don't want to lose their position, their, their paycheck. There's that. So I think that's an easy explanation of why none of this really comes out in, in a larger scale. But I think most of it is that they just don't, they don't see it because they've been firewalled. And most people are seriously firewalled. I mean, just literally will not see what's in front of their eyes. Literally will not see it. So some of this is much greater in, 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 in most people than it is in others. I don't know why it's varying degrees, uh, but... You know, that, but my answer to why, you know, when I thought about it, I thought about the question. I didn't answer right away of why, why they would come up with that. If it was flat, why not just say it's flat? Why not just teach everybody it's flat and it's got a dome, blah, 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 you know, and all this. And I had to think about it, but it didn't take very long before it hit me that the end, the final disclosure that we're thinking about, that we, only us now in this era can can understand their final alien disclosure idea of the cutouts that have been mm -hmm. that have been created and designed for that final disclosure could never ever ever be pulled off if everyone always knew like their texts say it is whether you're looking at job or whether you're, you know, Corinthians or wherever you're looking at where it says this or where it says that, different things where it talks, where it seems to be talking about how the earth is constructed or how this, this realm is constructed. Even if you leave that out, uh, everybody up until about 500 years ago believed, believed that. So what you have is you have a need. There's a need there. I mean, you think about it. Why would they, Galileo, why would anybody come up with any construct, pulling it right out of there, you know what, that this place is a globe, it's round, it's this big, it can be measured, blah, blah, blah. Why would they even come up with that? Like, how, how can they even come up with that? They can't see it, they can't feel it, they can't observe it, they can't perceive it. 
it's a narrative. It's a narrative that was instituted, it was given to them, but why? That's what they were asking me, why? And the only thing I can come up with is the creator. It's, if they come up with that narrative, then it's round spinning. And look out there, there's all kinds of other round ones, and they're spinning, and there's people on them, and they're coming here more and more, and they've been here. Look at the caves, look at the Sumerian tablets, which for all I know were made in some, you know, underground lab and <laughs> buried all over. <laughs> you know, and then, because of all the damn tablets in the world that are made out of granite and everything else, right, that, that you know, uh, different tablets from David and, and, uh, and, and Canaan and different things that we have that I've seen, that I put my hands on, uh, the, you know, half a tablet, three quarters of a tablet, a little piece of a tablet made out of granite, made out of this, made out of, you know, hard rocks, little pieces of tablets. Oh, no, we got 5,000 Sumerian clay tablets that are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, look what we found. We found 5,000 clay tablets, and they're all almost perfect. That's, that is astonishing. It's, it's so astonishing that I know it's not true. And I don't care why it's not true. I don't care who made them. I know it's not true. I, I, somebody put them there. It, it, somebody from somewhere else put them there. It doesn't matter to me. All I know, it's not true. And then they got the top mason stitching going in there and telling you what it means, and, and none of it means that. So, because other scholars now are saying, nah, you know, they're calling BS on that. But this is what we have. Why? Why? Because it, it's just a continuance of, of augmenting and turning the narrative back. As, as people become enlightened, it starts coming back. So they, they need to keep pushing it in from side to side. You know, keep putting barricades on the off ramps so so that, you know, less and less people, the further we go, can't get off the highway. See, and that's what we're looking at when we look at this round this round thing, globe sphere idea. The only reason to implement that, in my mind, this was my personal opinion, the only reason to implement it that I can think of, and believe me, I have crunched this up and down on why anyone would implement this. And I can't come to any other decent conclusion and it's not because it's my paradigm because I am very good at getting outside of anything that I believe I might be getting stuck in I've lived my life like that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. not allow myself to get hooked on anything that I can't prove absolutely as far as we can prove on this planet and it also has to be proven in the natural realm as well for me and in other ways so I'm not just a by-the-book guy. Just because it says it, and I don't care if it says it in Hebrew, I don't care if it says it in Babylonian text, I don't care if it says it in 20 other Egyptian texts, that's great. That's just one proof. But I use many other proofs that I built my own way of doing it that, that covers me, that covers me. So I know that no one else can go back further and say, no, 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 you missed this, you know. And uh, this negates all these other 20 that you have. Now, well, that doesn't work either, right? So, but when I look at this, the only way I can, I've come up with it, is, is, is to enable them over such a long period of time, which blows my mind. But again, if you're dealing with archons, if you're dealing with other entities that are also eternal because of us, then, you know, 5,000, 15,000, 25,000 years, 5 million years is nothing. It's not a big deal. It's not no. a big deal. No. no. Not a big deal. So for us to see these narratives looming through over time, over such great vast distances and, and, and geo geographical distance, everything, uh, then we know there's something else up. You know, no narrative uh, among a certain people just flows through to all other people and sticks for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It It's... it's how I keep telling people from the first book that even through your own Hebrew prophets, you, you see that the elite on the earth, the evil ones, wherever they are, whoever they are, whether they're coming down here in angelic form back then and, or soul form back then and thinking of angels, that people think they're angels or that, that whole superstition. So, but you, you do see that the truth, the most original truth is I've shown people in the first book has been, will go a certain amount of time, and then it will get covered up. And then, not long after it gets covered up, and it's definitely gone, uh, man has completely lost it, 
it gets reiterated by, you know, and we have a story of it getting reiterated to whoever, Enoch, and then he gives it to Noah, right? And then, and then Noah, uh, Abraham, Abraham grows up in the house of Noah, which most people don't realize that he grew up partially in the house of Noah in Ur. So he learned it for Noah. So Abraham knows the mind of the Creator. And that's why the Creator liked him, because he learned it and he kept it and he believed it and he moved it on, right? And then it gets lost again, and then it gets reiterated again. So to, to Moshe, right, and then to probably Jesus. So we we have all of this the, the same as above, so below. But when I when I look at this gold thing. If you want to, at the end, because, you know, you're up there looking down and, and you understand where you're going with this where nobody else does, and you're manipulating the narratives, then this narrative needs to come in because <clears throat> you're sitting up there saying, well, you know, if they all know that uh, they're, they're on, a created flat, uh, on a created space, which is not a sphere, and there's a protective dome over them that none of us can get through, then... Uh, and they can't get out, then uh, they're going to know someone created it. They're, 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 we can't apply enough doubt while they understand the reality of their creation, their surroundings, their natural surroundings. So we can't apply enough doubt. So what are we going to do? Well, here's what we do. We put this narrative in. It's a sphere. And it's just one small sphere among quadzillions of innumerable spheres with other races that their God created. And then we'll make sure the religions all replicate that idea, which you see the papacy doing quite a bit in the last 20 years, especially now. So, you know, they're waiting for the aliens to come so they can baptize them and tell everybody the last narrative. The last narrative being, these are your creator. And the same way nobody asks which God, no one's going to ask who created them. And then who created that one? And then who created that one? And then who created that one? Because I swear, they're dumb. So, I, yeah, I don't know how this ends. <laughs> you know, I can only go by the prophets and hope that a, a, a bit of that is true. You know, but none of that is good. Hmm. And when I look at that, I say, well, are most of these prophets, like especially Revelation, the Christian uh, commentary of Revelation, things like that, are they just put in place for the assimilation of that narrative so that people yeah, you, yeah, know, you, know, actually, you know people believe it and then and 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 they and they regurgitate it emotionally so i think this is a real good place to kind of end this episode of the triunity series with dr shamil asher shamil give us some uh, give us some information on how to find your books your materials well the book people can find on uh, amazon and on your site. And um, I also have the AHLC at blogspot.com, a blog, uh, where I, there's some stuff there, not particularly just about the book, but a lot of different things. So that's the two spots. Clearly, we've kind of gotten messed with with this show in terms of some technical things, including echo feedback into my mic and the uh, disconnection in the middle of the show. So that's going to wrap it up for this time. I'm Randy Moggins for OffPlanetRadio.com. The truth is out there. It's inside you if you are willing to do the hard work and uh, gut-wrenching searching that requires. We'll see you the next time. 